and a 10 booster gold. Michael John Carter started off as a glory hogging show off in the 25th century. Michael is a gifted athlete, getting to attend Gotham University on a football scholarship until his father came back into his life. After leaving because of a gambling problem, Michael, desperate for the approval of the father he just met, gets convinced to intentionally lose football games for gambling purposes. But when he was discovered, he got expelled and ended up getting a job at the Metropolis Space Museum. However, with the aid of a robot named Skeets, Michael stole devices from the museum displays about superheroes, including a Legion of Superheroes flight ring and Brainiac 5's force field belt. With the help of Rip Hunter's time sphere, Michael traveled to the 20th century, intent on becoming a superhero and turning it into a business for his own gain. Which, I mean, kinda smart. Like what Billy thought during the beginning of his superhero career in the Shazam movie. Eventually, Booster Gold ended up discovering his true abilities and actually liked the whole superhero thing. So we just stuck to it without as much of a hidden agenda. In a nine Future Flash. While some may consider Future Flash as a villain, and it's technically true, he is still Barry Allen with a cause that I mean seems fairly normal. At least in the comic book version of normal. While yes, the villains justify their missions, Barry's mission was to kill himself in order to prevent Wally from dying. Thus changing the future, and thus everything he did in the future would be obsolete. He wouldn't have needed to kill all the rogues or any other villain, and he wouldn't be alive to do it, thus saving everyone else in the future since he only killed them to gain enough speed to travel back in time. So while yes, he did kill a lot of people, he did it so that it wouldn't happen, so technically he killed them in order to save their lives. So it's a very noble cause. We talk about weird stuff like this literally all the time, and it's kind of sad how I understand it perfectly. My whole family watches the Flash series on the CW, but my mom stopped because she couldn't understand the whole timeline shenanigans thing. But I could, fairly easily. And I understand this perfectly even if it's confusing. And it ate Spider-Man 2099. Miguel O'Hara was born in New York City many years after the end of the heroic age, which is our modern day of hero stories. Eventually in life, Miguel becomes the head of genetics program at Alchemax, intended to create new super soldiers they call corporate raiders. Great name. Miguel is inspired by Spider-Man and uses records of him as a reference in hope that one day he can create a similarly powered person. After a human test subject dies, Miguel wants to resign. However, his boss, Tyler Stone, instead tricks him into getting addicted to Rapture, a highly addictive drug that only he can provide to Miguel, if he keeps working for him. But luckily, Miguel had put his own genetic code into the machine during initial experiments, so he attempted to use it to set his DNA back to before he got addicted. Smart plan. Except Miguel's rival, Aaron Delgado, sabotages the machine, causing Michael to gain 50% spider DNA. He survives the sabotage, but then realizes he has spider abilities. His boss sends men to try to find this new spider person, and Miguel dons a costume to conceal his identity while he combats his pursuers. However, some people actually believe that Miguel is the original spider Spider-Man back from the dead and thought to bring back the return of Thor. I've said it before, but Spider-Man 2099 is my favorite alternate version of Spider-Man because Edge of Time is one of my favorite Spider-Man games and that costume is just dope as hell. Like, look at it. Ah. And it's 7XS. Jenny Ognatz is the granddaughter of Barry Allen and was kidnapped by the Dominators even though at first she did not show any signs of super speed. Her super speed only activated when she saw her father being tortured by the Dominators. She was able to escape with her father before fire from the Dominators caused their base to explode. After this incident, she checked herself into a lab to get help in controlling her super speed. Once she did, she was drafted into the Legion of Superheroes. At least if you look at the comic version. In the Arrowverse, XS is the first daughter of Barry Allen and Iris West Allen, played by the wonderful Jessica Parker Kennedy, who came from the future during seasons 4 or 5 of that show to meet her father and get to know him, and train alongside him. She appeared at her parents' wedding in various other places in season 4, and only really made an impact in the season 4 finale where she helped Barry destroy the Star Lab satellite that the Thinker had sent crashing to Earth. Her helping her father caused events in the timeline to be moved up, like the appearance of Cicada and the Crisis on Infinite Earths event, which was probably only because Arrow couldn't get enough seasons to make it to 2024, unfortunately. Since Emily Vett had left and Steven decided it was time to say goodbye. So, um, I blame you, XS, for ending arrow. So. And it's six, Cable. Cable's first appearance was in the New Mutants number 86 in a next issue teaser, which was followed with a full appearance in the New Mutants number 87. At first, Cable was meant to be an entirely separate character, a new leader that contrasted their first mentor, Professor X. However, he was later written to be a future version of Nathan Summers, the son of Scott Summers and Madeline Pryor, also known as Jean Grey's clone. He's from the future since as an infant he was transported to the future where he grew up to be a cybernetically enhanced warrior before returning to the present because comics. There's also a young version of Cable that comes from not as far in the future, 
to come, that he comes back and then kills his older self because he wouldn't send the X-Men back to their proper time. Something which Young Cable does to keep time intact, but then he resurrects his father using a bit of the Phoenix Force, which is basically the same thing that old Cable was doing, but like... Mm. So an even younger version of Cable comes along and kills Young Cable. Okay, not really, but can you imagine how screwy that would be? Like a baby Cable just pulled up in his stroller and shot him in the head. <laughs> oh my god, I need that. Oh, boss baby number two. I think that would be kind of funny, but also really headache inducing when it comes to the timeline and paradoxes and whatnot. But, you know, typical comic book scenarios. Halfway through number five, Rip Hunter. Rip Hunter is one hell of a man. He is a time traveler, guardian of the time stream, leader of the time masters, and previous leader of the Legends of Tomorrow. Rip spent his entire life planning for enemies a time traveler would face. So in an effort to prevent someone from killing him as a child, he invented the alias of Rip Hunter, when he is in fact the son of Booster Gold, something that not even Booster Gold knows. Rip invented time travel technology in the post-crisis universe, and has helped both Booster Gold and Animal Man and their time traveling escapades before taking on the Illuminati conspiracy. This dude took on the Illuminati. If this video gets demonetized, just know that it was them. Rip eventually ended up getting stranded in the past in the prehistoric era. Somehow he was able to return to the present, and after doing so, he began protecting Earth's heroes from time traveling villains. In the CW's Legends of Tomorrow, Rip assembled a team of heroes who were known as legends in the future in an effort to prevent Vandal Savage from taking over the world and killing his family as he had in his timeline. But it was later revealed that he picked a team of individuals who weren't remembered by time, and that would be missed if they died, even though Sarah Lance had come back from the dead like three separate times at this point. And for Old Man Logan, the world of Earth 807128 has been conquered and divided among supervillains, with territories belonging to the Abomination, Magneto, Doctor Doom, and the Red Skull, who had named himself President of the United States, which sounds an awful lot like what the Beyonder did in the Spider-Man 90s cartoon, where he sent the Red Skull, Doc Ock, Doctor Doom, and the Lizard to a planet unknowing of evil to see how they would react. And those four villains took over the planet and ended up having Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, Iron Man, Captain America, and Storm along with the lizard, take them down. However, in this story, Logan lives with his wife and children in California until the Hulk gang, which is a group of what I'm gonna call Hulklings, created when Hulk had assaulted his first cousin, She-Hulk, and then the Hulklings kill his family. And Logan says the Wolverine persona had died when the villains attacked and conquered, only using his claws once after that event. His mission was to get revenge for his family and kill Maestro, a future version of the Hulk. And in the Venomverse, this version of Old Man Logan races Bruce Banner Jr. for 15 years before telling him of his true parentage. At that point, Bruce gets mad and storms out, which is really weird and confusing. Why would you do that? Your father was a psycho, of course he wouldn't tell you. In a 3 Batman Beyond, after everyone Batman cares about is dead, he's given up fighting crime. But an athletic 16-year-old named Terry McGinnis, Terry is his name and I know it. After stumbling upon the Batcave, Terry realizes who he really wants to be and begins fighting crime under the tutelage of Bruce. But Terry has the aid of a new age high-tech bat suit that augments his abilities, which I don't really understand, but hey, it's 2039, so who knows what tech we will have by then. However, Batman retires in 2019, so technically at this point he isn't fighting crime anymore. I, I know that he still has comics being published, but like, he isn't retired, but he is also retired. Like, no more Batman for you. Also, Terry, 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 his name is Terry, I will not make the same mistake again, it's Terry, not Tyler, and, and if you don't understand, I accidentally started calling Terry Tyler, because I was just typing and wasn't paying attention, so I just typed Tyler. Yeah, I called him Terry at the beginning of that number, just not the rest of the time. It's kind of a joke here now. It's a, when I first started. And a two, Connor Hawk. The CW has had quite a bit of time travel over the years, and while in the comics Connor Hawk may be the son of Oliver Queen, on TV he's actually the adopted son of John Diggle. Originally in the timeline, John Diggle Jr. was Connor Hawk, but after Flashpoint and Excess changed the timeline, John Diggle Jr. became the new Deathstroke and leader of the Deathstroke gang. And the hero known as Connor Hawk is the son of Ben Turner, aka Bronze Tiger and Sandra Hawk. Bronze Tiger did actually renew his name when he helped Oliver stop the riots after Diaz attacked the prison in an effort to kill Oliver, but eventually Ben ended up dying due to a stray arrow that Connor couldn't stop. If the timeline from the Legends episode of Star City 2046 is still canon, considering how that at that point he was John Diggle Jr., not Connor, but I don't know. 
I can't confirm. A lot of things in the show got screwed. Anyways, he was brought to the past when the Monitor brought him, Mia, Smoke Queen, and William Clayton back after Renee's daughter had just been killed by John Diggle Jr. so that they could meet their fathers in their prime and help in the Crisis on Infinite Earths event, which only Mia ended up helping in. So, um, yeah, the other two kind of like didn't show up. So yeah, uh, thanks for that. It's not like the universe was ending or anything. Finally, into number one, Old Man Peter. Old Man Peter is probably the most horrifying story on this list. The story of Spider-Man Reign is a four-issue comic limited series set 30 years into the Spider-Man of Earth 70237's future. In this future, New York City is essentially a safe area, even if it's under total control of its mayor. Superheroes and supervillains are gone, but the government has an incredibly ruthless police force known as Lorraine. Peter works as a florist but ends up getting fired because he's Peter, but when he gets home, there is news of police brutality coming from Lorraine. J. Jonah Jameson delivers Peter a package, not like that. He also apologizes to Peter saying he sold the paper because of the lies. Inside the package was Peter's old camera and the black suited Spider-Man mask. When J. Cube starts a riot, Peter puts on the mask and fights off the rain wearing only his mask and his underwear. Which is disturbing on its own. But the worst part about this is that Mary Jane is dead. Dying due to being exposed to radiation thanks to trying to have kids with Peter. Meaning that Spider-Man is so radioactive that his swimmers killed his wife. Which is horrifying and has way too many implications and I don't want to think about it. Did they have like five heads or something? Great, now I'm thinking about it. Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Days of Future Past. Taking place on Earth 811 in the Uncanny X-Men 141 and 142, back in the early 80s, Written by Chris Claremont and John Byrne, this was of course the inspiration behind the major motion picture with the same name, released in 2014. The movie, first of all, is my favorite X-Men film of all times, and the two-parter comic sure does deliver the goods. So right off the hop, we see this dark world divided by three classes of people. We have H for humans, clean of the mutant gene, a for anomalous human, so a normal person possessing mutant genetic potential, and of course M for mutant. The year is 2013 and it's just a tad darker than our 2013 ended up being. So after the assassination of Senator Robert Kelly, mutants are being hunted down by sentinels. Either that or a few exceptions were sent to internment camps, which is still quite a grim future. Now of course the whole fun of this is the fact that Kitty Pride can alter the timeline and prevent this from happening. So give this story a go, and if you liked it, which I know you will, you can queue up the movie right after. And before we continue on with this list, if you haven't already, please go ahead and toss us a thumbs up, because it really does go a long way here at the studio. It's this one, not this one. Unless you're from ancient Rome, then maybe it's flipped, I don't know, get with the program. Now back to some dark futures. And number nine, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe. Mm -mm, not Wade Wilson, no way, yes way. Wade Wilson kills the Marvel Universe and it is gloriously gory. Deadpool of Earth 12101 that is, a little bit different. So this issue was released August 2012 and just the front cover, you know you want to take a peek in. So what's the story here? Well, the X-Men put Wade into the Ravencroft Asylum in attempts to, you know, heal his insanity. But of course the doctor wasn't too good at handling such a task. The doctor being Psycho Man, of course. So he brainwashed Wade in hopes to shut down all of his inner voices. It worked. The only downside, those voices were now replaced with voices that were encouraging him to, well, kill everyone in the Marvel Universe. Right off the bat, this series pulls you right in. It opens up with the Fantastic Four in a not great spot with Wade Wilson. He kind of kills them all. Like Reed Richards' face is all rubbery and it's like, looks like it's melting off. And then Sue has to watch Deadpool kill Johnny before meeting her demise as well. And that's just the first few pages. Huh? Then the Watcher ends up taking us back to the beginning and how it all started with Dr. Psycho and then all that jazz. It's honestly a really, really fun run. Not for the faint of heart, of course, but definitely fun. Number eight, Old Man Logan. Now, we were all so happy to see an R-rated Wolverine story on the big screen with, of course, the release of Logan back in 2017. Now, this source material has to come from somewhere, so it was loosely based on the story Old Man Logan, written by Mark Miller and Steve McNiven, released in 2009. The film had Logan in the spotlight alongside Charles Xavier and Caliban, and it's one of my favorite R-rated movies, but in the comics, the story has moments that are even darker than what we saw. That's right, darker. So due to certain character rights, obviously, we didn't have nearly the same amount of superheroes in the film, but the comics, oh boy, gets pretty weird. I won't even mention Hulk Gang. Oh, I just mentioned it, damn it. 
This version of Logan wants to be peaceful, but with blind Hawkeye coming along and pitching a cross-country drive, things get a little messy. And number seven, Age of Ultron. Released in 2013 and written by Brian Michael Bendis and Brian Hitch, this crossover event was a 10 part story. And with the Avengers Age of Ultron movie released just two years later, it was pretty popular in sales. The story starts off with a bang. We have Hawkeye's perspective, and he's actually on his way to try and rescue Spider-Man. And the world isn't looking too good. We have Ultron's return, and his sentinels are guarding the streets. Are there others? Spider-Man asks. Not enough, Hawkeye responds. Guys, honestly, this story is incredible. It really makes you love Hawkeye even more. Like, the amount of characters used in this seems like it's almost over overwhelming at first, but with the world being in peril, there's like this calm but urgent energy that's trickled throughout the pages, and it actually makes it really tough to put the book down. Even going back and referencing a few parts, I just ended up reading the last like seven pages. I was like, what am I doing? I'm gonna be late. There's this really cool monologue type conversation that Peter has in the second issue, and you see him explain his perspective, like how he woke up and the world was just gone to shit and it's done really well. And then it kind of pulls back and you see the remaining superheroes and there's not that many. Number six, 2099. Published in 1992, this is the future where we all got cool costumes. And of course the future has to be shiny and metallic. Didn't any of you watch SpongeBob? Future. We see some fun stuff in this line of issues. For starters, we get the classic future Spider-Man suit. So fans who stuck around until the very end of Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse were treated to a nice little 2099 Spider-Man voiced by, of course, Oscar Isaac. The sequel is going to crush it, oh my god. So we see, of course, future versions of your favorite characters as well, like Doctor Doom, who actually becomes the president at one point, which is super neat just the guy you want as a president. The most notable part of this future is Spider-Man's point of view. His run, of course, starts with Spider-Man 2099, and it's always a good time to see what people think the future will look like. It's always shiny and blue. For some reason, everything's always blue in the future. It's just like boring and blue and like kind of shiny. I don't know. Number five, Hulk Future Imperfect. Seeing our heroes grow up on screen and on the page is a wonderful, wonderful thing, usually. Seeing Old Man Cap at the end of Endgame made my throat tighten up so fast. I felt like I was gonna cry like out of my neck. It was the weirdest, I was holding back. I got all my friends there, big 3D glasses, and I'm like, don't cry, man, don't do it. I loved that story arc. But what about other characters living out their days, like the Hulk? Well, making his first appearance in a vision in the Incredible Hulk Volume 2, Issue 401, Maestro was the main antagonist in the Future Imperfect storyline. The story takes place about 100 years in the future after a nuclear war put the planet real close to extinction. So an alternate future version of the Hulk, Maestro had been absorbing all this nuclear radiation the entire time and ended up becoming like the strongest thing on the planet. Massive increases in strength and anger plus the brains of Banner made him pretty unstoppable. It's beautiful, but so scary. You gotta check it out. Number four, World War Hulk. Again with the Hulk. This one is pretty wild. So Thor Ragnarok was loosely based off the Planet Hulk storyline. Loose in a sense because the comic didn't end up going so well. So on Sakaar in the comics, the rocket that he arrived in ended up blowing up, causing casualties that left the Hulk, you know, angry. So what did he do? Well, he heads back to Earth and thus begins this World War Hulk storyline. The five part issue released in 2007 by Greg Pak. And this is a very dark but very fun version of the big green guy. He just destroys everybody, all the heroes that Earth has come to love, just in the path of this very aggressive angry beast. It's crazy. He locks the Illuminati in Madison Square Garden and makes them fight to the death. I mean, I definitely pay for that. Nowadays, with movie theaters being closed, I'd pay for anything. Let's go. I mean, once you spend enough time on Sakaar, it becomes second nature anyway, so whatever. In the first issue of this series, you see Iron Man in his Hulkbuster armor, and he uses repulsors to accelerate his punch, which is something Iron Man can be seen doing in the MCU. I like when they keep small details. Just adds to it, you know? It makes it a bit more fun. So make sure if you haven't already to grab all five issues of the 2007 World War Hulk story, because it's a treat. Number three, Marvel Universe vs. The Punisher. I began this list talking about Deadpool, trying to kill the entire Marvel Universe, but what about the other ruthless killer, Frank Castle? This 27 miniseries written by Jonathan Mayberry and Goran Parlov shows the entire world somehow even crazier than our world today. 
See, everybody on Earth has turned violent due to this biological weapon. So right on the front cover, we see, well, we see this. We have all of our heroes drooling like they're cannibalistic creatures. So it's up to the Punisher to walk around and save the lucky few who are not infected. Number two, Age of Apocalypse. This epic 38 part crossover is one for the books. With a combination of creators on board like Scott Lobdell, Roger Cruz, Joe Mandurira, this world we find Professor X's son, Legion, but he accidentally kills his dad before the X-Men were even a thing. Interesting. Then things go from bad to worse. In comes Apocalypse, just right on time to ruin the day. Well, not just ruin the day, but take over the world, rather. The X-Men have always been the time travel group. I mean, it's no surprise, these guys have so many time travel missions. I mean, look at their roster. Earth 295 changed forever after Legion's failed mission to kill Magneto. So Apocalypse ended up attacking 10 years earlier than in the original timeline. Trouble ensues. And finally, number one, we got Spider-Man Noir. We go now to Earth 90214, not to be confused with 90210. Great show. This is arguably the darkest Marvel future. This Earth has quite an interesting roster. See, while in some issues like Age of Ultron, it's said that New York was once full of like 7,000 different superheroes. But in this universe, only a few actually have powers. That being Luke Cage, Daredevil, and of course, Spider-Man. This series ran from 2009 to 2010, and it was an alternate universe event. And this dark vibe works really well with Spider-Man. The 1930s, turns out, is a great time setting for a Spider-Man story. It kind of felt like Watchmen. It was like very dark and grim. Spider-Man carries a gun with him. Bop, bop, it doesn't shoot webs. I know, I know, stupid. Basically, the story is the same, only Peter is raised during the Great Depression, and Uncle Ben, was actually killed by the goblin because Uncle Ben was an activist and protested against sweatshops. As if Uncle Ben couldn't get more likable. We were happy to see Nicolas Cage play this Spider-Man in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. And I like that casting choice a lot. Nick Cage is the man. If there's one line that I'm ending this list on, it's Nick Cage is the man. <sighs> Number 10, Dr. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan is not very good at people. Case in point when he altered Superman's family history by rescuing Jor-El from planet Krypton, just as it was exploding apart. Dr. Manhattan ended up doing this in an attempt to better understand Superman's seemingly natural sense of goodness. However, rescuing Jor-El at this crucial moment and then setting him up to have him watch and observe his son's life only made Jor-El go insane, especially as he'd already been resigned to die alongside his family left on Krypton. Jor-El living didn't give us the happiest of endings as he became the mysterious, complicated, sometimes heroic, sometimes villainous Mr. Oz. And while this might not seem so disastrous to us, the readers, I'm sure from Jor-El's perspective, learning about all of the cruelty of humankind throughout the years was pretty shocking and heartbreaking. Number 9. Cable Cable messed up his past by killing his own future. Yep, he messed up not just the past, but his own past and his future. He just messed it up. All up. But also, he kind of weirdly, neatly ended up closing off his time loop at the same time. Does that make sense? Basically, when old Cable died, it was at the hands of his younger self, young Cable, who had come to end his life. Old Cable, of course, knew that this was coming and inevitable because he was once his younger self who had killed his older self. It sounds more confusing than it is, I think. In killing his older self, young Cable would later reflect and wonder if in doing so, he'd actually made a big mistake. But the cool thing about Cable is that because he's usually a time traveler, he's never really gone. Like Doctor Who, there are many different points in his timeline we haven't yet seen, so he can always still return and pop up still alive, but at a different point in his timeline that we simply haven't seen yet. And there may have even been a simpler way to fix the problem of old Cable's death than most of us probably thought of, but you'll get no spoilers from me on that matter. Check out the Cable series if you want to learn more about this timey-wimey mutant stuff and how it all goes down. But also just check it out because it's an amazing series. And friends, before I move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn more about time traveling, futuristic superheroes, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, The Teen Titans. The Teen Titans end up learning the hard way how even trying to help save the future can end up ruining your own future. But in the past, Time travel stuff. 
It's confusing. In Titans Tomorrow, the Teen Titans accidentally create an alternate timeline when they travel to the 31st century to help the Legion of Superheroes beat the Fatal 500. On their way back to their own timeline, they accidentally end up 10 years into their own futures from whence they left, only to learn that this past and their future has been dramatically changed. The older versions of themselves they meet are villainous and tyrannical in nature, becoming known as one of the factions of the Titans, Titans West. And in this reality, Titans West are the villains of the story in comparison to the opposing faction, Titans East, who are basically like the heroic Titans. But none of the Titans that are the main characters are on that group. They're all evil. Oh no. Number 7. Moira McTaggart Moira isn't really a time traveling hero, but she still is futuristic in the sense that she has lived through multiple alternate futures. During Dawn of X, we learn that Moira is in fact a mutant whose powers are that of reincarnation. But not as in she dies and just springs back to life. More in the sense that she dies and is reborn, repeating her life again from birth. Because of this, Moira has a lot of experience when it comes to fighting for mutant rights. And she she is seen and being a key player in the mutants and humanity's repeated downfall. In fact, it seems as though almost every single one of her lives has had a worse outcome than the one previous to it. Well, except for the one that she's currently living so far. Moira is currently on her 10th life, which seems to be going much, much better in comparison. With this life taking place in the 616 reality, it seems as though Moira with the mutants may have actually succeeded in creating a future where they will all get to thrive. However, it should be noted that Moira is in her 10th life, an important one since Destiny once threatened Moira and using her own powers warned Moira that her life would not be quite so infinite as she thought, seeing roughly only 10 lives total for her to live through. Maybe 11 if Moira plays her cards right. So this could be Moira's last one. But how will it end? Number six, the Flash. There are multiple Flashes that have attempted to mess with time or reality, and as you can expect, it never goes well. Wally West's attempt was no exception, although at least he just barely managed to avoid disastrous results. But this one was a close call with a lot at stake, and so for that reason, I'm gonna count it. This all went down when he, Wally, learned in New 52 of the kids that he'd had in the previous continuity who had been lost. He was willing to race through time in order to save them as fast as he could, but it turned out this was all a manipulation of Hunter Zolomon's. Snap. Wally West almost destroyed the speed force and hyper time in the process, but managed to avoid doing so when he learned that it was all a trick. Although he wouldn't rescue his kids this time around, Wally would later be reunited with them, and they're actually back in the continuity now, where Wally gets to resume a much more happy ending focused version of his own story. Yay! Number 5, Iron Man. Well, we might know Iron Man as a hero who helped to work out the kinks in time travel to set everything right in the MCU. In the comics, there was one major time where he kind of ended up doing just the opposite. Of course, this didn't happen in the main continuity, but in the What If story, what if Iron Man was trapped in the time of King Arthur, from issue 33 of the original What If series? Iron Man had traveled back in time with Doctor Doom before, but in this reality, instead of also returning back to the present day, he gets stuck there when Doom abandons him, traveling back without Iron Man. How rude. Not only is that going to likely be a problem back in the present day, but Tony remaining in the past ultimately results in the death of King Arthur. Without having an heir, Arthur, with his dying breath, passes the throne on to Tony. Sounds like history is going to end up being more than a little wonky as a result of this whole kerfuffle. Number 4. Iron Lad Iron Lad messed up by becoming Kang. I guess. And then of course going back in time and causing a lot of other problems for people in the past under various different identities that Kang has had throughout time. Iron Lad initially swore to not become Kang when he realized that this was his destiny, but over time he would come to team up with his older future selves. In fact, Kang, future Iron Lad himself, is the one to blame for Kang, it turns out, as in the newest series about the villain, we'll learn about how Kang ends up sort of training Iron Lad to become one of the best conquerors and villains that the Marvel Universe has ever seen. Granted, of course, Iron Lad doesn't really want to become Kang still, but if you can't beat him, join him, you know? Number 3. Legion Legion messed things up pretty epically for the X-Men and the whole world when he messed with time. And I know what you're thinking. Is Legion really a superhero, Amanda? Usually I would say that David Holler is more complex than that, or tends to lean more villain, I would even admit. But lately in the comics, he's definitely been playing the role of hero, with him joining Kurt Wagner, aka Nightcrawler, in an attempt to build a new 
Rasputin religion to unite all who live on Krakoa and Arako, which is now technically also terraformed Mars. Over in another alternate reality, Legion ended up traveling back in time in an attempt to take out Magneto, all in all with heroic intentions really. However, Legion accidentally ends up killing Professor Charles Xavier, his father instead. Xavier dies, which then not only prompts Apocalypse to attack 10 years sooner, creating the Age of Apocalypse reality, but this also causes Legion to disappear. You see, he killed Xavier before David was ever born, meaning that Legion therefore no longer existed. Time travel. Don't do it. Are you thinking about it? Don't do it. Number 2 The Flash This time around we're talking about Barry Allen's The Flash. The Flash is obviously one of the most well known heroes to have messed with the timeline and learned from his actions. Whether we're talking comics, animated, or live action, we've seen Barry Allen mess up time in pretty much every medium. Barry goes back in time in an effort to save his mom Nora after he learns that Eobard Thawne, his nemesis, Reverse Flash, was actually the one responsible for her death. <gasps> Gasp! Barry manages to save her but quickly learns why you don't travel back in time to do that kind of thing. His choice messes with all of reality, creating a flashpoint paradox and severely messing up the lives of all of his friends and colleagues in the future. In order to fix the problem he has caused, he must go back in time to fix the past by stopping himself from ever going to save his mom. And he wasn't even really able to fix the problem, quite so simply. He messed things up so bad that even in setting things straight, he actually shook up the entire DC universe, ultimately resetting the continuity and creating New 52. Number 1 Booster Gold Booster Gold has ruined the past a few times before in the comics, though I think one of the craziest mess ups I've ever seen is when he tried to do something nice for Bruce in honor of his impending marriage to Catwoman as a wedding present. Oh how nice! Booster Gold planned to travel back in time and save Batman's parents on that fateful night so that they could attend his wedding and Bruce could be happy. Unfortunately, doing stuff Stuff like that completely messed with the timeline in the worst kind of ways, as Booster would learn. In saving Bruce's parents, he created an alternate reality. Despite Bruce being happy there with his family, it also put Bruce at odds with Selina. She ended up being imprisoned in Arkham in this reality, losing her mind, and hating the Waynes for basically closing the orphanage and putting her in Arkham Asylum. Booster attempts to remind Batman and Catwoman in this alternate reality how much they love each other, but instead, their meetup kinda just results in a whole lot of death. When he goes back in time to try and stop himself from ever saving Batman's parents, knowing what kind of mayhem it causes in that alternate future, Bruce from the alternate timeline goes with him to make sure he isn't able to stop his past self from saving the Waynes. Ha ha ha. However, future Booster does succeed, causing alternate Bruce in grief to take his own life. It's all pretty awful. Everything gets fixed in terms of the timeline, but Booster definitely bears emotional scars from this whole experience. To be honest, Honest, Booster probably has a lot of trauma from time travel experiences. If you want to check out this story for yourself, you can read how it all unfolds in Tom King's Batman run during the Gift story arc, which starts in issue 45.